The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. Welcome to The Stoa. Uh, my name is Jared. Uh, I'm the kind of stand-in steward uh, for, for this session. Um, and uh, and yeah, just a quick thanks to, to Peter for for making this. Uh, what is what is the Stoa line? Is it a, this is a place for us to cohere around dialogue? I don't know. I can't remember. I'm, I'm a failure. I'm a ter terrible steward uh, in the Stoa. Stoa. But uh, anyways, um, so yeah, today we're going to be talking a bit about Vajrayana and things. And so I'll just hand things over to to Charlie, and uh, we, we can get started here. Thanks, Jared. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to Evolving Ground at the Stoa. My name is Charlie Aubrey. I'm co-hosting with Jared. I'm also known by the Tibetan name Rinzin Pamo. I write at vajrayananow.com. So this is the first session of a foundational series in which we're going to draw on the methods and principles of Vajrayana Buddhism to inform an approach to contemporary life and practice. And so Vajrayana means literally the path of the Vajra, the Vajra path. A Vajra is a ritual weapon symbolizing indestructible force. That's, this is a Vajra. It's a little one. You can get some very big ones. So Vajrayana is eventually about learning how to appropriately access and harness the raw power of your personal, emotional, mental, social circumstances in order to engage in useful, creative activity that benefits other people. Vajrayana is um, it's quite a late development in Buddhism developed roughly around the 6th century in India and a couple of centuries after that it spread into Tibet. It also developed distinct branches in Japan and in some parts of Southeast Asia. Vajrayana comprises several fields or domains of practice you might say. It includes Buddhist Tantra which is quite distinct from Hindu Tantra. Uh, there are many crossovers historically it also includes Dzogchen and it includes Mahamudra. <clears throat> these are all terms that you may have come across in the Buddhist sphere. So what all these fields of practice have in common is that they're characterized by an attitude towards physical, emotional, mental, social experience that is non-renunciative. Vajrayana's methodology draws on involvement in actively engaging with desires, with attachments, with emotions, and with circumstances. So it's very different from some other forms of Buddhism. Buddhist Tantra employs the principle of transformation, and transformation requires engagement. It requires involvement. Um, Dzogchen and Mahamudra work on the principle of integration and liberation. You can't integrate without engaging. So all of Vajrayana is it's defined by the employment of non-renunciative methodology. That's what distinguishes it from other sorts of Buddhism. So a little bit about myself. I have a background in traditional Vajrayana practice. I was an apprentice in the Arota lineage of the Tibetan Yingma school um, for many years. I took tantric vows in uh, 2002. So I practiced Vajrayana in a traditional setting for more than 20 years. Uh, then about, I guess, 18 months ago, I gave up adherence to the ordination vows in the traditional form that they take. And I moved away from that traditional practice setting. Just a little bit about my background. Um, Jared and I got together about a year ago. Um, we were discussing practice and uh, meditation in relation to Vajrayana practice and Evolving Ground came about as a result of our discussions over the last year about Vajrayana view 
and employing the principles of Vajrayana in contemporary form. So maybe you could introduce yourself, Jared, say a little bit about yourself. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, my name is Jared Jaynes. Um, I have been, um, I guess, a, a serious meditator for around six or seven years. Um, I started out in the kind of pragmatic Dharma scene and spent a lot of time um, with uh, unified mindfulness, which comes from Shinzen Young, and um, and then also a fair bit amount of time in uh, 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 the Mind Illuminated by Jula Dasa, which is kind of a um, uh, a little bit more of a, a shamatha concentration path, um, and uh, it always kind of felt a little bit like an outsider. Uh, I couldn't couldn't really sign up. I felt like a tourist, um, and. Uh, uh, ran into to Charlie's blog because she was uh, talking about um, the difference between uh, shamatha and um, and uh, shine, which is a, a similar practice, but from the Vajrayana view, and so it's kind of radically different in some ways. Um, and so, uh, you know, over the the past year, we've I've kind of moved into uh, more Vajrayana uh, practice and, and stances and, and perspective and just kind of overall disposition uh, and, and kind of finally found like, I was like, oh, this is, this is where I belong, I guess. Um, and, uh, and yeah, we wanted to kind of share it. And we did one of these Stoa sessions um, about a month or two ago, I believe, thinking like maybe a few random yogis would show up and uh, it ended up be being a lot more interesting than we thought. So uh, it seemed like this was the right time to, to try and, uh, uh, you know, do something a little bit crazy. <laughs> um, so I wanted to give a, a quick little outline on, on the plan for today uh, and then hand things back to, to Charlie to, uh, talk about, you know, kind of the, the main presentation today, which is going to be on method. Um, and <clears throat> um, so, yeah, so basically we'll have a, a quick presentation. Charlie and I will, will uh, talk a little bit about uh, those concepts, uh, then we'll do some Q&A, uh, and then we'll move into uh, breakout sessions uh, for each individual, to some, some individual groups to be able to, to kind of relate and, and have some more personal stuff, and then we'll uh, regroup uh, as, as a, um, as we wrap things up. Uh, and then I think we'll also, after we stop recording, um, we'll probably stick around for a, a bit uh, if there's some lingering questions or things. Um, so so yeah, feel free to, to stick around a, a bit afterwards uh, if, if that sounds like something that's interesting to you. I think that's it. Let me, let me look at my, we were trying to be a little bit more organized last time. We were uh, kind of flying by the seat. Yeah, it was kind of spontaneous, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I think that's so we're, it. So we're, we have a plan today. <laughs> Structure. Um, yeah, you, Charlie, you want to start? But, right. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, I'll say a little bit about what we're intending and uh, what we're doing here. Um, so, yeah, our, our intentions are to create the space for a community of knowledge and practice that's informed by Vajrayana. So, really, for people who want to live with the views and with the principles and the methods, the functions that were all developed in the traditional Vajrayana lineages, but without the cultural worldview that generated them and with newly adaptive forms that are um, fitting for contemporary experience. So Vajrayana forms the base, the root for this series, Evolving Ground. Traditional Vajrayana is the ground from which we're evolving, if you like. Um, so in particular, we're working with principle and function in Vajrayana method and path. And so all the way through the series, we're going to be coming back to that theme. We'll be exploring what that means and how to employ Vajrayana method in different contexts. So this isn't a rejection. I want to make that very clear. This isn't a rejection for something new. It's the offering of something new as well that is very much grounded in a history and in a, a lineage that has a certain kind of coherence to it. 
So it really should be possible for anybody practicing in this community to move into a more traditional setting and a more traditional worldview without experiencing some great sort of conflict in principle or some kind of contradiction there that shouldn't happen and vice versa it also ought to be possible for people to move from traditional settings to practice with evolving ground and actually have some sort of sense of familiarity and recognition so what i'm saying is that if if you understand how a practice method works in terms of its principle and, and in terms of its function, then that that's translatable into lots of different contexts. So the, um, the, the principle and what it's supposed to do um, and the, the, the context are all the sort of key elements here that make it possible to move between different environments um, with similar sorts of practices. So this first series comprises the ground or the base from which all kinds of forms, new forms might arise. Um, but the material presented is hopefully it's going to be like the 101 for the system that we're building. And so as such, it's also the link. It's like a link in a chain back to traditional Vajrayana practice. So what I want to say about that is that the, the more involved you become in any kind of system of practice, the more informative it can be to understand the history and the roots of that practice or the tradition of knowledge, tradition of knowledge, if you like. And it can save a lot of time. It can cut through incoherence so once you start having a feel for a system and its practices, how they might function in your life, understanding how they were generated and what gave rise to them, and I'm talking socially and politically here as well, it's very good at some point to get a much rounder, fuller sense of the context of the practice, the historical context of the practice, rather than an, a, what you might call an aesthetic understanding. This applies across all domains, I think. So you begin to get a much better sense of how and why a particular mode or method functions in the way that it does. And in doing so, you're better able to predict how something's likely to pan out. Um, what the different outcomes might be from following specific modes of practice, for example. Uh, I should say something about principle and function. So Jared and I use the terms principle and function frequently. Principle is how something works and a function is what it does. Kettle employs the principle of transforming electricity into heat and its function is to boil water, tap employs the principle that manually turning a screw lifts a washer and then its function is to regulate the flow of water. Chud is a Vajrayana practice. It employs the principle of cutting through the habitual relationship to corporeal form, our habitual, um, the way that we are with physical reality. And its function is to induce an experience in which death and life are understood as inseparable. Or, you know, that's one way of putting it, different ways of putting it. So it's very good when you're practicing or when you're meditating um, with, with anything really, it's very good to have some kind of understanding at least of the function of the activity that you're engaged with, what it's supposed to do, where it's supposed to lead. And if you get into the habit of figuring out and understanding the principle and understanding the function of your, your activity, then that can help bring some coherence into navigating your way through all the different practices and cultural views and different histories that are available. So I think I'll talk about method, which is the topic of today's session. So each, each session in this foundational series, we're going to take one topic. Today's topic is method. Um, what do I mean? method. Um, it, it's 
quite probable that I'm going to slow down sometimes because I really want to use language quite carefully and I want to be clear about what I mean and you know I think we have a kind of tendency in Buddhist circles to use phrases that have become a bit cliched maybe a little bit you know they're very widely used so what that leads to is a lot of ambiguity or a lot of fuzziness um, around meaning Sometimes, you know, this kind of particular cliche or phrase use you, um, if you, if you stop to notice what's going on, you can kind of get the feeling that the function of a word or a phrase is not in keeping with what it purports to be, like it purports to point to something special or something different or non-ordinary, but the actual function in context is just to give a feel good vibe or, you know, or something or signal authority or something like that. So I think, I think it's really useful to notice how words function um, socially, somatically. You know, how is the use of certain words affecting your sensibility? What function does the particular language that some guru or some authority is using, what, what function does that seem to serve? I'm kind of getting tangential here, aren't I? supposed to be talking about method so anyway yeah I think some words have been horribly abused in that they've they've come to uh, sort of be ways to manipulate people's hopes and desires if you know what I mean they sort of subtly manipulate promise and I think that happens a lot in spiritual circles reality the word reality is a word that's been it's gotten abused in this way So anyway, I think what I'm saying is that I don't want to do that with words and language, but because of that, it means being very conscientious, maybe a little laborious. So I might need to just kind of stop and think sometimes um, about what I'm saying and how I'm saying it. So anyway, method, method. So I want to say something about how I see method as being different to tool. These, they're nouns, they're somewhat distinct. I'm using the word method in a very particular way. So a tool is a thing with which you apply a technique. Think of some, some literal examples. You have a wrench, you fit the wrench to a bolt head, you apply some force, you turn the nut. It's very precise. Not a lot of wiggle room there. Your wrench is like, it's like a certain size. It's going to be quite um, defined. It's, you know, it's a sort of very adapted for a particular specific use. You fit the nut, you turn it, you, you could apply this wrench in many contexts. Um, in British, that's a spanner for the Brits now. So it's pretty much always going to be the same motion. It's going to be the same technique. So a, clue, a, a tool, a tool is a clearly defined object for our purposes, the way that I'm using that word. It's pretty obvious what a wrench is. It looks like a wrench, it works like a wrench, it's a wrench, right? If you couldn't mistake it for a duck, or a, uh, it doesn't quack like a duck. The te technique is like very precise. So a technique, how does a technique work? It, it's like you can hone your technique. You you can make it more refined. You can, the way that you become familiar with a technique is that you get even less wiggle room. It's, it's really precise. It's ever more refined. So you think about meditation as a tool. That's what you've got. You've got a tool. You apply your technique. That's going to be very clear and precise as well. So examples of meditation techniques are like focusing on the breath, concentrate on the breath as object, ignore the thought. There's a little bit of wiggle room there, not a lot, there's a little bit. You can like, do you focus on the in-breath or the out-breath or the all, all of the breath, but you know, it's really quite honed. And it's like you practice 
in order to further refine that technique that's how your practice develops you narrow in on the sensation at the tip of the nose um, or something like that you know it's it's ever more refined it's ever more concentrated even less wiggle room so that's how tools and techniques work your meditation can be a tool with which you apply a technique so now let's think about method a method is not a tool a method in the way that i'm using this term is a way it's a way to employ a principle so i was thinking about this i came up with this um analogy um a sort of very literal analogy which is paddling paddling being the principle so i mean paddling like you do in a canoe not paddling in a puddle that sort of paddling you you use a paddle so if you're in your canoe and you're paddling in white water down some rapids you're going to be using the paddle in a very certain way you know it might be quite frenetic or maybe it's quite a light touch but it's all pretty chaotic it's unpredictable there you are like paddling away frantically trying to stay upright in the water and you're employing the paddling principle that's an aspect of what you're doing there in order to navigate your way through the white water so there you are paddling if you are canoeing across a very still lake you know the paddling you're still paddling but the paddling is going to feel very different still paddling still paddling because the principle is the same you're using a flat board at the end of a stick to generate the force to guide a vessel maybe there's a little bit more precision possible when you're paddling on the lake but there's a lot of wiggle room right there's a lot you can paddle very deep and you can move forward quite fast or you can use the paddle to kind of to steer the vehicle in one way or another or you can go any which way you want you can you can go backwards you're still paddling so as a principle paddling is highly adaptable it doesn't have to be a very precise fit it's uh, you know it's it's not like a wrench which is of a very particular size and a very particular application it's really quite different and you can really you can change your method and employ the principle of paddling you can use a kayak not a canoe you've got a different sort of a paddle but you know the experience changes again You're still paddling you take like one of those uh, precarious board things that people stand up on and uh, again very long sort of paddle thing and you're moving yourself around um, on the water but still paddling paddling still paddling it's quite different same principle different method so where are we going with this so take a little moment now maybe think about the difference between these two analogies and how they're distinct and how they reflect the difference between tools that apply techniques methods that operate according to principles like you know analogies are never perfect but there's a distinction here that i'm pointing to the distinction between different ways of practicing different ways of meditating different ways of relating to life circumstances so when when meditation is your tool you're you're applying your precision technique maybe that's focus or maybe it's concentration of some sort when meditation is your method you're employing your principle so supposing supposing the principle that you're going to employ in your meditation is um remaining uninvolved remaining uninvolved so let's think about that if you're very sleepy your eyes want to close and your brain brain is kind of you've got brain fog and you're sort of drowsy remaining uninvolved that's maintaining conscious aware presence remains on 
remaining uninvolved with the sleepy experience. That's the practice of remaining uninvolved. It's going to feel a certain way. It's going to have a certain sort of quality, certain sort of texture to it. Um, it's going to be defined somewhat by a sort of sleepiness and a, a sort of slight sort of tension with sleepiness, isn't it? And then the practice at that point is defined by the experience of remaining uninvolved with sleepiness. So by contrast, you can, uh, you know, if, you, if you've got a very different sort of meditation experience, if you say, for example, you can't stop thinking about the film that you were watching last night, the remaining uninvolved practice is going to be maintaining presence by remaining uninvolved with the film story, with the visuals, with the memories, with the, you know, all of that activity that's going on. It's going to feel very different to remaining uninvolved with sleepiness. The way you even employ that principle might be quite different. So, you know, another example, like if you're, you're experiencing little itchies and little spiders walking all over you, that practice of maintaining conscious presence and awareness without involving the sensation of the the you know without getting all involved in that sensation and wanting to do something about it you know that's again it's very different very different indeed so um the difference here between meditation as your tool and medit meditation as your method, like, you know, when it's your tool, it really doesn't matter what else is going on. You apply the technique and it's always the same technique. That's the whole point. Like everything else is a distraction. You apply that technique and you further refine the, the technique. You, you don't stop focusing on the breath. You maintain your concentration. You're keeping it the same. When, so when, when meditation is your method, you're employing a principle, you're, uh, say you're employing this principle of remaining uninvolved, the experience is shaped by that context of uninvolvement. So the context, the environment within which you're employing that principle shapes the experience of what it is like to employ the, the principle. It doesn't always mean the same thing. It's still the same principle, like still paddling, you know, still remaining uninvolved, paddling, adapting to context, shaped by the context. Using a spanner, it's always the same motion. It's always going to be the same thing, like righty tighty, lefty loosey is the thing, isn't it? It's like it's always the same focusing. You just get better at it. Keep doing the same thing. So that is a way in which Shine meditation, remaining uninvolved, is quite distinct and quite different to the way that we're using these terms, shamatha and focusing and concentration. Shine is highly nebulous by comparison. It's really, uh, there's a, so much wiggle room there. So that makes it not quite so easy to put your finger on what you're supposed to be doing because you're, what you're doing is employing a principle, not applying a technique. So you can't, you, you can't do that automatically. It can only ever be intelligent, right? You, you can't get into this. You're still doing the same thing. And there's a sort of gradation. And that's why it's very easy to lose the practice when, when you're practicing Shine. It's really easy to, you, you know, that's just going to keep happening. You're going to keep losing it. You're going to keep losing it. It's, it's kind of different to focus and concentration. Uh, you know, focus, concentration, that, um, that technique, it can be kind of graduated in a way that is less easy to do with remaining uninvolved. Um, you can have, you know, when you're, when you're using focusing technique, you can kind of have a less sharp focus somehow and then get better at the focus becoming more sharp and sort of more keen, like that sort of precision tooling analogy. You just can't do that with remaining uninvolved. Not so much. Anyway, it's, um, it's less graduated. You tend to fall into involvement and then find uninvolvement again. That's kind of how it works. And then, you know, the, the periods of uninvolvement with whatever it is, they start to, to lengthen once you become more 
familiar and more um, adept at applying or employing that that principle. Uh, so, so meditation, meditation is an example of a method. It's just it's one particular method that can employ a principle and remaining uninvolved. That was an example of a principle. But because it's a principle and, and not a technique, like with paddling, like with the, you know, paddling with the canoes, all the different canoes, all sorts of method can employ that principle. And this can get broader and broader. It, it can become quite nebulous. So you can get to the point where you say it's the context that is the method that defines the principle, if that isn't a little bit too convoluted. You can remain uninvolved. You remain uninvolved when someone's wrong on the internet. You can remain uninvolved when someone's you know, attempting to coerce you into behaving in a particular way or you know, trying to make you do or say something that they want you to say. You can remain uninvolved when anger is arising. The definition is maintaining conscious presence. It's like the, the definition is, is awareness of the whole situation without involvement. That's all. That's employing the principle. So going back to the technique, you know, technique is really exclusive. It's distinct, it's precise, and you know, it's some, somewhat conceptually abstract as well. It can look and be the same in any kind of context. Whereas employing a principle is really context dependent. So that's another important difference, I think, between the principle of remaining uninvolved and the technique of, of focusing. Remaining uninvolved, it means that the choice, the option for involvement is always present. Remaining uninvolved, it's not separate from involvement. It's defined by knowing and seeing and feeling the possibility for involvement. That's always there. It's always there. So the more the, that you get used to that, it's like the easier that option becomes. Eventually, it's just a choice. It's like there's no pull in the direction of involvement, although the possibility of involvement is still always present. So that's, um, that's like an example of a principle and how the context, the context, which is the method, shapes the principle. So if meditation is your method, you can employ the principle of remaining uninvolved with whatever arises. And then once you get quite familiar and you get quite comfortable with that, it becomes possible to employ other different principles. But, um, you know, in, in Vajrayana practice, a lot of them really do rely on this familiarity with remaining uninvolved. And methods and principles kind of go hand in hand as well. It's like I've said that the context defines how the principle manifests, like what it, you know, what the, what that texture is like, what it looks and feels like. Remaining uninvolved with thought stories, you know, it's kind of different to remaining uninvolved with sleepiness. And the, the principle defines the method to some extent. They're, they're sort of in, inseparable in context. You, you, you know, you, you don't take a, a paddle up on a, a mountain hike. It's kind of it, it would be incongruent to employ paddling while you're hiking. Just like you know, it's it would be incongruent to employ renunciation of attraction and and desire when you're engaging in a romantic relationship with somebody. It would be a misapplication of principle. So, yeah, maybe yeah. I've, uh, maybe, how long have I been going on for a while? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I was kind of, as you were talking about this, well, uh, you know, the, the first reflection that came up is because we we're talking about the, the specifics of, of practice um, and uh, getting used to, to Shine, because coming from this concentration for, place, uh, you know, many of the sits are very, very similar. Uh, they, they, you know, you're, you're always trying to recreate the same experience in some way. 
Um, and, uh, and, and the more that I've gotten comfortable practicing Shine, the more I'm like really interested. Like, so on our, we have a Slack channel and we always do the, we do, uh, some, some people practice, uh, we have this little practice log where we give a little update on, you know, how our, how our meditation went for the day. Uh, and the first thing I always write is the environment that I was in, because that is kind of the, mm -hmm. that's the context that defines so much of the, the quality of that sit. Right. Um, as to, as before, it was always like the, the context was more of a, a hindrance or something to be overcome. <laughs> yeah, now that's kind of interesting because I think in a lot of um, systems, there's this ideal that you would find a very, very quiet space. And I think that actually can really help a lot when you're beginning to meditate, but there is no requisite for that for Shine. It's not like a part of the, um, it's not a part of the tool of shamatha you know it, it's different in that way that yeah you could find yourself in quite a noisy environment you'd still apply the principle mm -hmm. yeah yeah and, and so your your sitting can have sort of very different qualities at different times and it can still be the same method yeah mm -hmm. yeah. yeah radically it's uh mm. <laughs> it's very it's it's a bit uh well, it brings a bit of interest, I suppose, for me, because yeah, that was one thing, uh, you know, maintaining your awareness, kind of like, there has to be some sort of something interesting in your experience. Uh, and that was, I think, some of my early shamatha experiences, like, I knew what it was supposed to be, it was already predefined. Um, and if it was going uh, as planned, it was exactly the way it was. But it, it kind of got, it was a little bit hard to keep my intention to, to stay with it because it was it was not it was very you know, like, yeah this is what right. I thought it was going to be yeah. <laughs> now yeah. it's like a surprising thing every time yeah. something I'm really curious about is whether um whether you get more boredom in Shine than you do in Chamata I you know I don't know because I'm mostly coming from a Shine background but you know um boredom has this kind of very particular flavor like it, you know, if you meditate for long enough, you're going to experience boredom. So I, I sort of wonder whether because of the focus and the concentration and shamatha that you've always got something, you know, there's always something there. I kind of wonder whether boredom is less of a feature. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, because the... What do you think? For me, at least, especially in the beginning, Shine was very boring. Um, oh, yeah, because <laughs> yeah, it was like, <laughs> yeah, I needed yeah. without a technique. It was like, what am I supposed to be doing here? You know, like, it was the definition. Yeah. Of, there's nothing to right. do. Well, but, yeah, a lot of people coming to Shine, I think they do experience that. Um, you know, what even is this? It's like, what am I, you know, it's so nebulous. It's much, much more nebulous. Mm -hmm. as, a, as a practice then you know um, and, it, and it's not systematized within itself in the same way that some shamatha practices so it's not like there's this very um, clear clearly defined set of steps which you can work through which is you know that's very appealing very mm -hmm. appealing in some way but it's really heading in quite quite a different direction and the experience that you have at the end of that is going to be quite quite different as well yeah. Well, and I, I would say this also does kind of speak to the fact that, um, you know, the, the, the technique heavy stuff um, can be, I think it's very common, uh, especially with, with broad teachings, um, because you have to generalize and, and, and try and replicate a similar environment so that people can, you know, know where they're at, uh, where so much more of, of the, the practice that I've been doing ever since moving to more Vajrayana view relies on getting feedback and and yeah talking to people and, and yeah. especially somebody who has more because it, yeah it's so because, using yeah. your personal life and circumstances and it's actually working with your personality and yeah. in some way and you know personality is very much personality and relationship really are the path aspects of buddhist tantra so mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's very different flavor in that in that sense. Yeah, I'm I, well. Todd, I'm kind of curious just to, to to call some to call Todd out. Todd, did you? Uh, Todd, Todd was a very experienced shamatha uh, practitioner. Uh, we practiced together in the past, and uh, um, and you've moved to Shine recently. Uh, was boredom part of your? Have you have you run into boredom yet? I don't know. It's it's it's. Uh, you've had a different uh, uh, experience starting Shine than me, which speaks to the the how much variability there can be. Yeah, I, 
probably the opposite for me actually uh, i i feel like i went through just terrible long long stretches of boredom in in shamatha and it, it just it was interminable and uh <laughs> so i i feel like i kind of maybe beat it out of me or something you know i get to the point now where i feel like i can find almost any aspect uh. of experience at least moderately interesting so <laughs> that, that's helped a little bit with that uh, with you Ning. Yeah, maybe boredom's just kind of par for the course in, in meditation. Yeah. yeah. I mean, one of my uh, earliest experiences of uh, what they call nepa in the Tibetan system, which is um, that sort of very clear, uh, um, expansive, spacious, bright, sharp um grounded experience that came through sticking with boredom it was like you know really really instant like instantaneous sudden change of state into mental clarity and it, it kind of felt like i really remember it because it was so it, it was just so different to anything else that i'd experienced at that time and i, I just remember this you know i'm so I'm so bored and I'm kind of sleepy and I'm just sticking with it and sticking with it. And so it was like a veil lifting somehow in terms of the, the mental experience there. Yeah. And to put it in context, Nepa would be the, the fruit of Shine practice. Of Shine, of Shine practice. Yeah, that's, that's correct. Yeah. Um, I know we had a couple questions. Did you want to take a look and see if there's in the so chat? So what's been going on in the chat? I was just we kind of a few on things coming there. in here. Uh, I, I just, it's a surfboard. There's a surfboard. There's a surfboard. There's Wiggle a... room and surfboard. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, with regard to the spelling of Shine, and um, Shine is a transliteration um, of the Tibetan syllables, and there's no standard spelling of it. In the Arata spelling, Nakchon Rinpoche uses a, a grave accent. Um, you can see it spelled lots of different ways. Uh, you sometimes see, you see she, nay, n-a-y phonetically. Um, it's, it's, the pronunciation is kind of she, nay, nay. So yeah, you know. Um, it's not like there's a correct way. And I will say to to even just kind of uh, come back to Charlie spending a bunch of time in the beginning emphasizing language. Um, the intention uh, of this project is to move away uh, eventually from a lot of the the, the more traditional and, and yeah. Sanskrit, uh, language. Um, and right. And yeah, we haven't gotten a name for for Shine yet, but we have talked about it. So the, mm. there's a. And yeah, and I think in this first foundational series, we'll be using Tibetan terminology, we'll be using some Sanskrit, and beyond that, we will have, um, we'll probably step into it being, uh, you know, pretty much all English. I, know, I saw Sarah had a, a good question about the difference between mm -hmm. remaining and evolved and, uh, and a kind of disassociated cool distance way of relating to the situation. <laughs> it was right below the, the technique or the, um, the spelling question from Lydia. Hello, Sarah. Would you like to, to ask your, your question or uh, sure. so that we have it on the recording? That would be great. Thank you. Yeah. So when I'm the remaining uninvolved is I'm wanting to know more about like the distinction between that and um, the kind of like pop culture, like distant, cool, like dissociated. And I mm. can make a guess of dissociation involves protection, armoring, resistance to some sensation. And then you could remain uninvolved with the resistance. And I guess I want to feel more connected to the remaining uninvolved and I don't currently quite feel that. Right. So yeah, I see what you're, you're getting at. There's this very 
distinct difference between um, renouncing, rejecting, um, uh, having some sort of separation and barrier and wall there, and the choice to remain uninvolved, which you know I was saying about having this always present potential for involvement. It's like uh, the connection is always there. There's, there's still a connection when you remain uninvolved. You see maybe, uh, so take an emotion as an example. So you feel the arising emotion. So there are different choices that you have when the sensation of the emotion arises. I mean, you know, there are different things that you can do in response and you could you could just completely ignore that push the sensation away stop feeling the sensation uh, you could control that sensation so that it subsides that is that is not what i'm referring to with remaining uninvolved remaining uninvolved doesn't get involved in that kind of way i mean you know if you're pushing the pushing your sensation away you're actively ignoring it you're actually involved in some way you're just kind of pretending not you know you know what i mean so you allow the sensation to arise and choice is available if it's there and if you're connected with that sensation then choice is always available and the choice is maybe to not express so you you're feeling the sensation but you're maybe not um showing and expressing that sensation intentionally outward in connection with other people. So you're remaining uninvolved with the sensation, but you still have a very strong connection with that sensation. It's still there. The potential to do all kinds of whatever is there, but you're just letting it do its own thing. Yeah. Letting the sensation do sensation and, and, and mutate and, and evolve and do all kinds of things. I mean, the way that we get into these um, habitual expression or repression or, you know, control of emotion or, or um, manipulation manipulation this this kind of projection of emotion onto everything that's just as much um you know that's kind of the flip side of of repressing it you know it's the it's the giving full reign to that quality of your experience um so you know th those are both involvement in some way so remaining uninvolved allows the sensation of the emotion just to stay around and be there um yeah yeah it's it's interesting for me you know when i'm language is so hard with shine because as, uh -huh. as try said it's it's very nebulous um and yet like as i've practiced more and more I, I've, I've almost come to see that there is a kind of a flavor to involvement um, and involvement is, you know, well, so, so even Chine is the first of these four practices that are uh, building up to Dzogchen practice and Dzogchen talks a lot about how mind is always kind of manipulating, overlaying, judging, uh, putting things in reference points. Um, it's always kind of, it's an overlay on, on your experience. So it's always manipulating the situation in some sense. Um, and when ordinary experience ordinary experience yeah, yeah. um and so and, and remaining uninvolved leads to this this uh, uh the state this napa eventually um that it really just it, it there there is no categorization there's no preference there's no judgment there's no um agenda you know it's, it's just like it's just allowing things to be very much exactly the way As they, they are. are yeah and I haven't right. had, I'm afraid to say that just because I know the cliche is going to be <laughs> rife with you know, letting things be as they are being in the present. But I mean, that, another way of saying well. it is just allowing space around whatever arises, whether that's internal or um, in relationship, mm. you know, not having that kind of immediate need to, uh, yeah. Focus in. Yeah. Right. This is Define. really important for, for practice 
as uh, you know the, the practice of the path in Vajrayana because you're that is so much about involvement and activity and creating stuff and doing stuff and you know enjoyment and everything that in order for that to occur and main and and occur in a way that is useful and beneficial you actually need that space you need to be really familiar with it so that so that the activity is choice because otherwise it's just habitual you know you're just doing the same thing and you can't actually see you can't see those patterns you can't see those uh, habitual ways of relating because they're just you know they're they're so automatic but having this uh, practice to begin with and this familiarity with um, remaining uninvolved just means that activity can occur in a very very different different way with a different kind of quality to the experience mm -hmm. um, thank you I know Sarah. Tyler uh, Altman you said you had a question to further distinguish method and tool I think that might be would you want to ask your question Sure. So um, I was thinking about the the wrench example, um, and in, in in my mind it related to uh, I thought of hammering since I've done a bunch of hammering, um, and I was thinking about um, last summer when I was dealing with wooden um, nails instead of metal nails, and that you know it was basically the same sort of action, but there still was a little bit of context modification in there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe not, not as, uh, my, my hammering had to be a little bit more precise, not as, um, uh, high magnitude or what have you. So it sounds, it sounds like one of the differences you're pointing to is sort of a spectrum of the amount of context adaptation that you need. I think so. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Since it, it seems like in almost any tool use, there will be some slight, um, attention to context and modification. That's but, right. Yeah. But then it, 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 it does yeah. feel like a qualitatively different thing to have sort of like context modification be the almost like the, the, the entire flavor of the activity, you might say. Yeah, yeah, that's very nicely put. Thank you. I've been, you know, I've been thinking quite a bit how to express the experience recently, the experience of the difference. And yeah, I think you said that very nicely. Um, and I think also there's something about the direction in which you're heading with each of these, like mm -hmm. the, the direction you're heading when you're hammering is you just get better and better at hammering and, and sort of increasingly able to be more precise. And I think something that you get better at nebulosity, the better you get at remaining uninvolved. You get better at the indefinable um wiggly sort of uh gray areas somehow yeah yeah, yeah. and the direction you're heading is expansive and with the hammering the direction or you know with with meditation as a tool the direction that you're heading is really pretty specific you know there are some very clearly defined end goals one of which is cessation Right. Yeah, it's very specific, it like there, yeah. There's even quite a pretty distinct um, scoping of awareness that happens in each one. Yes. Um, when I'm focusing Nicely like very yeah. narrowly yeah, 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 yeah. on, on, on yeah. breath meditation, for example, yeah. it feels like it's almost like get, going infinitely to yeah. a, a single point, whereas yeah. um, right. other types of more nebulous meditations feel like they're entertaining mm -hmm. more and more of my environment. Mm -hmm. And eventually what you're doing in the... Uh, the, the more shamatha oriented, the more um, what we would call sutric approach is that you are honing in so much that you get to a point where there's an explosion into separate, entirely separate uh, transcendence, if you like. Thank you. And that is very different. That's very, very different from the, uh, the approaches within Vajrayana, which are you're moving towards an experience which is is never going to be clearly defined it will it, it's much more about congruent activity in the moment 
It's about relationship with the what is arising in the moment. So there's it doesn't it doesn't lead to a point of transcendence. It, I would say maybe it leads to a point, or not a point, it doesn't lead to a point. It leads to a scope or a sphere of um, fullness, completeness, complete apprehension, congruent, congruent apprehension. It's not like saying that, that you can have perfect information. It's more... Um, full engaged presence in life in the relationship with the present moment yeah and i guess appreciate it and and um even more of a kind of uh, uh vajrayana thing you know they, they vajrayana is so much defined on this play between emptiness and form and so the wholeness is the integration or kind of yoking if we're yogis right. here of these two dynamics of the, the pattern and the um and the nebulosity um and and shine is a quite you know it's not the uh, this is a, a very the beginning of the base it's the base yeah it's, it's, not it's the, the ground so we're going to be looking at shine a lot in in these series we'll kind of come back to that as the uh, example of quite often mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah so yeah shine is really getting a real familiarity and comfort with nebulosity so that then you can learn to integrate and kind of allow yeah. the, the, the yeah. form to, to, to. Yeah. And so it is kind of slightly artificial as well. Mm -hmm. You know, that's something that Nat Chen Rinpoche always, I remember him saying that, you know, it's not an ordinary natural state. It is something that you are intentionally cultivating it's not, um, you know, in Zogchen, there's this phrase, the natural state. That's not, um, well, it depends what perspective, you know, it can be an aspect of that, but it is not an ordinary everyday state. It's something that we cultivate and become more familiar with. And then eventually it just kind of arises naturally in different circumstances. And I do think that I get the sense, especially from spending a lot of time in the, with the more, uh, transcendent uh, perspectives uh, or sutric perspectives. I think we, we were thinking transcendent might be a little bit more broad uh, ranging, but yeah. yeah I, think I think transcendence is the, is the result, isn't it? Or the intended result in that more sutric context. Mm -hmm. You could say, yeah, transcendence. Or, yeah, yeah. And, and the part of NEPA that, it, that would be, um, or that that's kind of uh, the most uh, constructed is that there is no thought that's arising when you're in this, this state. And I think a lot of other transcendent uh, uh, approaches see that as like, that's the goal. Like that's when everything's perfect is when there's no thought anymore. Uh, things are just the way they are. Yeah. And I, I can really see how that happens as well. And, you know, it, it's such a nice state to be yeah. in, you know, <laughs> it's, it's so weird. Yeah. Yeah calm and clear and lovely you know i think the the thing that isn't um, talked about a lot is that there are different qualities of thought free state yeah. and you can have this kind of very very quiet calm um almost like you're in a sort of bubble state and that is really very different to this state nepa that we've been talking about that is you know it's thought free but it's really bright i mean the i always i always want to use this word bright it's just you know very expansive but it's still yeah. thought free so there are these very different mental um mental states that relate to different paths yeah yeah and and i even i think one of the most emblematic things from a traditional perspective is just looking at like the the art from very renunciative forms of buddhism which is you know you always have the the serene shakyamuni buddha right. you know in his pleasant just like grin <laughs> like oh everything's fine and then all yeah. of a sudden you're doing tantric art and there's death you know ah, like, yeah. and wrath and <laughs> you yeah. know uh, yeah, yeah that's a nice uh mm. It, yeah, finding uh, the, the the kind of um, 
the beauty in, in every aspect of our of our personality. Um, yeah. Mm. I know we're we're getting close here. Charlie, did you want to start orienting toward what we want to do in the the, the group? Uh, breakouts, or do you want to yeah. answer any more, a couple more questions? Before yeah, does, we do that? Are, are there more questions? Let's take a look there and see more, if anybody else wants to ask a question. Because I'm sorry, I haven't been paying a lot of attention to the chat because I'm really bad at multitasking. Basically, I've been on some um, some Stoa type or Zoom videos. I'm just so impressed by the way that some people can just kind of relate to the chat and still talk and have it. Lydia is very good at that. You're here, Lydia. I can see you're in the chat. <laughs> yeah. So does some other, is there another question in here? Oh yeah, we got, we got a fair few. Uh, let's see here. Let me, um, maybe, uh, Na Rao said, uh, you had a question on connection. Uh, finding presence of awareness. Uh, did you want to ask your question or? Uh, yeah, sure. I just wanted to like clarify, I guess. Um, so uh, when you talk about remaining uninvolved, would that be pretty much the same as saying that you don't really make a choice or choose to not make a choice or like you do not react to a phenomenon? You're aware I mean, of the possibility of a choice. Yeah, yeah. So you're okay. choosing the uninvolved aspects. So there is, yeah, there's a choice. There's a choice there. Right. Yeah. And, and the second part was uh, you said that there is like a connection. And uh, I was wondering whether the connection part is contained kind of in the finding presence of awareness part of the instructions. So there is still like presence of awareness. And this is what yeah. keeps you connected to like, you know, what's happening. Yep. Yeah. Right. Yep. Uh, good. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, and the, the presence finding of presence of awareness. Yeah, sorry, Jared. That uh, yeah. that is a phrase that um, I have brought from the Arotair context. It's a phrase that Nachan Rinpoche uses in relation to. I'm going to be getting a little bit Tibetan here, and Zogchen practice of Senzen, particularly, which is um, in English. He uses the phrase, and Kandrade Chan uses the phrase, um, finding presence of awareness in the dimension of whatever. So, in your in your Shine practice, you might start out by finding presence of awareness in the dimension of the breath, and then you're actually dropping that. So you're using that as a little bit of a support and then you drop that. And eventually in Shine practice, the finding presence of awareness is in the thought free clarity space of, you know, clarity and, and mental experience or the, the experience of um, stuff arising in, you know, in terms of body sensation or noise outside or whatever you'll eventually move into finding presence of awareness in the stuff which arises so that's that's the follow-on from shine so that that potential is always there in shine but you're allowing it to just be there does that make some sense naro yeah yeah absolutely uh, thank you so much thanks for the question and I, I'm actually kind of curious now. I got a question. Uh, so, for for the presence of awareness, is this um, is this directly uh, related to the empty element of the experiential? Um, yeah. Yeah. Like the empty yeah. the empty aspect of whatever is yeah. arising has to be in, you yeah. have to be in contact with it. Right. And we're talking about an experience here rather than you know a lot of. The, like 2000 years of Buddhism is arguing about emptiness. And it's like, yeah. Yeah, I guess we could say nebulosity. What it is. Nebulosity. Yeah, nebulosity is, a, it's, it's a really great way of bringing the understanding that you, um, the qualitative understanding of some kind of emptiness in meditation, understanding that as nebulosity in your daily activities is one way to have a connection with your meditation there. Um, I did see one other uh, question from Michael. Uh, this might be a quick one. The thought-free state, what is that? 
word thoughts or um, so yeah it, it, and this is yeah like, no it's anything that arises in um, uh, in in your mind so it's ideation uh, visual stuff that comes up not so much talking about bodily sensations so you allow um, body sensation to be as it is and remain uninvolved with that and that can you know the more you practice genie that does subside a little bit and it sort of mutates as well so it becomes sort of quite pleasurable sometimes um but you're mostly we're talking about thought free state uh, thought the tibetan word is nam tog which is just stuff that arises so whatever arises you remain uninvolved with it um for the most part when you start meditating and practicing that's going to be for most people that is thought um, and then, yeah, as you become used to having less density of thought, then you begin to notice all the other kind of stuff that goes on. And, and you know, I sometimes wonder, I think that what happens is that as the, the verbal density dissipates somewhat it actually allows a bit more space for other stuff to arise as well so there there are you know very well documented well known phases that people do move through in meditation but i don't want to say that these are prescriptive you know some people don't have a lot of verbal mental activity some people have an awful lot of uh, visual well, yeah, I'm just say awful. It makes it sound awful, but you know, I didn't mean awful. I mean, that was rather British phraseology. I just, you know, I just mean some people are more visually oriented. And again, within in Vajrayana practice, you're working with whatever the proclivity is. So, you know, if somebody just individually what they what they have going on in their mind is a lot of very clear, bright, visual stuff, then, you know, maybe Yidam practice is going to be a great practice for that person or, you know, working with the visual quality of things, working with vision is going to be really useful and, and helpful. Uh, you know, other people are more um, somatically inclined or, uh, yeah, conceptually oriented or whatever so you've really kind of work with personality in that way thank you michael yeah thank you do we want to uh yeah i think it'd be a good time to, to start moving toward moving the breakouts into... i'm assuming we might go back yeah. to get a little bit more on the method uh, uh note or something <laughs> yeah um so really, so the, the breakouts are uh, for you to explore the material that we've been presenting here um, in relation to your own lives and your own practice and, uh, you know, maybe help each other figure out, is this relevant? Is this not relevant for me at the moment? Um, how might this apply? Um, you know, just to have a little exploration of that material while it's still really fresh and then you know if anything arises and you have questions or insights or anything that you want to share we can come back for a bit more of a larger group um, discussion and exploration so should we do that now yeah i think so i had one quick thing I, this was something that came up but i didn't get to mention it um I, I thought it might be interesting because maybe there's some people here who don't aren't uh, meditating on a regular basis. Um, but the interesting thing here is that uh, similar to what we covered in our last Stoa session, um, there is kind of a general uh, technique or, or method or view that gets employed in informal ways throughout our life too. So this is one of the, th the things that came to my mind was like how we deal with our emotions, uh, you know, maybe especially the ones that are difficult. Um, did did you you know I I thought maybe the that we could make a little bit of a correlation with with the method of dealing with emotion in just day to day life so that, that we could so so folks that don't have the meditation background could talk about their informal experience as well yeah that's a great idea yep 
Um, yeah, I mean, basically, you, you can talk about what ever arises as well. I mean, you know, if there's something that is going to be um, helpful regarding employing Vajrayana practice or whatever, and it's different, then, you know, follow that lead. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Any, any questions before we do break out? Cool. All right. I will. Thanks, Michael. Bye. Uh, <clears throat> automatic three four weeks. oops Fine. there we go all right i'm going to do an automatic breakout so this is going to be random uh, since we have a fair amount of people so uh yeah we'll we'll see who you who you go with and then we'll we'll pull everyone back here i'll give a, a couple minute warning as we do uh it'll be probably at the right at the 90 minute mark is anyone saying anything oop nope not yet oh there we are. I just wasn't sure whether my sound had disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, no sound. <laughs> um, so as everybody files back in, um, Charlie, did you want to just do, do a quick uh, closing here, sign off for the, the STOA listeners and, and then uh, maybe do some reflection afterwards? Right. Or we can yep. do some reflection now and whichever way, what do you think? Uh, we've had 90 minutes so far. I think this is a good point to finish the recording. And thank you very much uh, to everybody who has uh, been listening and contributing. Um, and hello to future, <laughs> hello and goodbye to future uh, audience. Great, great. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to, to kind of quickly thank Peter uh, and, and all of the, the stewards at the STOA for creating this space for us. Um, and uh, and then a reminder, too, that the STOA runs on a gift economy. Um, so if, if you're getting value of this and you feel um, uh, com feel in, uh, compelled to, to donate or uh, anything like that, you can go to the stoa.ca and at the bottom there's a, a gift link, I believe. It might be the stoa.ca slash gift uh, is the, the correct place. I'm, I'm not sure, but I mm -hmm. want to make sure to always uh, say that. And uh, yeah. Thanks, thanks uh, yeah, we were going to mention the practice group as well. If anybody who has been listening and wants to become engaged in a community of practice or just wants to kind of check that out and um, experiment with Vajrayana View a little bit, um, we have a practice group uh, that is unrecorded that meets once a month at different times to try to... Um, to include all of the different time zones. Um, and we have a Slack group that is somewhat connected with the practice group and you can join one or other of those, our Happy Yogis Slack. Um, so. Yeah, if you're interested, uh, I guess the, the best way at this moment uh, would be to either reach out to me directly uh, my email is me at jaredjanes.com um, or you can DM me on Twitter. Uh, Charlie has a contact form on, on the Vajrayana now. Yeah, my DMs are open as well. So great. Yeah. Um, Feel and, free to get in touch. And there's also a good chat. chance that by the time uh, uh, folks are, are listening to this replay that you can go to evolvingground.org um, and that will should be able to point you in a direction. We don't have anything there yet, but it, it will... Uh, help uh, gather the, the yogis uh, in the near future. <laughs> so thanks for guys. Uh, and yeah, yeah, we'll talk to you next time at the next, next session. Um, all right.